Our New Testament reading today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day as we hear your word and give us courage to put your word into practice and be with us in all that we do in and for your work. In your name we pray. Amen. We humans are responsible, hard-working beings. We give 110% to all we do, and we are motivated to complete a task. Giving up is never an option. However, there are those rare occasions, those moments when we do not complete a goal, and those days as dedicated as we are, we just need an extra day off. I found an internet article in USA Today, it was posted in 2014, and it gives some pretty creative, creative excuses on missing a day of work. I will share with you some of the more ridiculous ones. This was taken from the Career Builder survey, and as I said, was posted from USA Today. I cannot come to work today because I just put a casserole in the oven. I cannot work today because I was at the casino all weekend and I still have some money left to spend. I cannot work today because I woke up in a good mood and I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> I could not work yesterday because I got stuck in the blood pressure machine at the grocery store and I couldn't get out. I cannot come to work for the next few days I have a gallstone and I want it to heal holistically. I cannot work today. My uniform caught on fire when I put it in the microwave to dry. I am sorry I missed the last few days of work. I went to a party this past weekend. As I was leaving, I was given what I thought was a breath mint. However, it was something else as I woke up three days later in an airport in Maryland with my clothes on backward and a map of Baltimore stuck to my forehead. <laughs> that one I took poetic license. <laughs> the truth is, is that we live in a world where excuses sometimes rule the day and people are not as dedicated as we sometimes are led to believe. That is a hard concept for us to understand. As God's people, we try and dedicate our lives to loving Christ, to doing His work, and to living out God's purpose for us. It is not the kind of calling that is prone to excuses. In today's scripture, Paul appeals to us, instructing that our, bo that our bodies are to be a living sacrifice before God. We are told not to be conformed to this world, but we are to discern the will of God to know what is good and what is acceptable and, and what is perfect. So let's unpack these two verses to see what Paul is saying. And when I was about 12, I had a Sunday school teacher who said that this passage of Scripture meant that our bodies are sacred before God, and that we should never do anything to our bodies that would disappoint or disrespect God. 
sacrifices to God were pure and unblemished, and that is how we should be treating and taking care of our physical bodies. Now, I've always remembered this from when I was 12, what was that, 10, 11 years ago? I, I've never forgotten that. And I like this explanation because it gives us the opportunity to serve God with our lives. It gives us the opportunity to praise God with our efforts. It gives us the opportunity to thank God for the wonderful gift of our bodies. And it allows us to show God how much we love Him and how our physical bodies can be pure and honorable. The problem with this rationale is that it can quickly be taken too far. If our bodies are pure and are to be that perfect living sacrifices, then how easy is it for us to allow our bodies to become imperfect and flawed? If our bodies are to be pure before God, should we be adorning them with tattoos and ear piercings and in today's world, any body part piercings? Seems to be how we do. Should we be dyeing our hair? Should we be tucking our tummies? Should we be having any kind of elected surgeries? As pure living sacrifices, shouldn't our bodies be free from rashes and dandruff and scars and warts and acne and allergies and liver spots and those pesky unwanted 10 or, or 80 pounds? If this is what Paul had in mind when he told us that our bodies are to be living sacrifices before God, I do think that our bodies, our very lives, are a gift from God, and we should strive to not abuse or misuse or, ne or neglect that amazing gift that we have been given. That being said, it is totally unrealistic to expect that as living sacrifices, our bodies should be perfect and free of all marks and blemishes. If we are using our bodies to do God's work, then we can expect some wear and tear and scars. Paul states that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Now Barclay says that true worship is the offering to God of one's body and all that one does every day with it. So when St. Paul says that our bodies are to be a living sacrifice, I think he means two things. First, I think as Christians, we are to show that sacrifice by living for God. We serve God, we demonstrate God's love in this world with our bodies. We use our minds to study God's word, to teach God's way. We use our voices to give God our praise. We use our hands to reach out and help those in need. We use our feet to carry God's message out into the world. We use our knees to bend down and show God's mercy. We use our hearts to receive and offer God's forgiveness. We use our, our soul to spread God's hope. And we use everything that makes us who we are to embrace and accept God's children. Second, when our bodies are a living sacrifice to God, we give our whole selves to God. When Christ becomes the center of life, then every moment, every action, every movement is for God. That means we can proudly state, I go to church to worship God. I go to work or to school to worship God. When I'm out to dinner, when I'm helping a friend, when I'm at the movies, when I'm a patient with my doctor in the privacy of my own home, in the moments when I am alone, even when I am taking the trash out to the curb, I am that living sacrifice before God. We Christians are not chameleons. We are not allowed to blend into our environment and do whatever we please when that situation suits us or fits us. In every situation, we must take the opportunity to serve our Lord and Master, to be that living sacrifice. This is hard to do. It's hard to do in today's world. It's hard to do at any point to always be that sacrifice, to always be on, to always think and put God first and knowing that we are His example into the world at every moment of every day. Here's what Max Lucado says about these verses. The only problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps wanting to crawl off of the altar. There are days when giving that 110%, living that sacrifice, being that example, honing that commitment, it's, it's too much. 
and we need a break. We need that opportunity to crawl off the altar and take a step back. And God is not only with us when those feelings surface, God comes to our rescue as well. In other words, God knows this. And when we feel overwhelmed and when we're doing too much, we can see God is with us. God is that small voice that calms us. God is that prayer or that thought that suddenly pops into our head when we need it. God is that friend that calls out of the blue and just at the right time. God is that child that crawls into our lap and brings us back to reality. God is the gentle nudge in the right direction. And God is the one that will always give us rest. God knows that our commitment to follow Christ is hard. But God also knows that we are precious. And He knows that the plan set for us, the gifts and skills given to us, are unique to us. God has woven us together to fill a wonderful purpose. We need to be proud that we are called to God. We need to be proud that we are that living sacrifice. In verses 3 through 8, Paul discusses the fact that we are one body. But like the body, we are called to different functions. This is an important fact when we exist as that living sacrifice before God. This concept of our relationship with Christ and our function in the church as being part of a body teaches us several things. First, it allows us to know ourselves. We will always go further in life. We will always be more successful. We will always be more grounded. We will always be more satisfied if we can honestly evaluate ourselves and know what we are and what we are not capable of doing. The body has several parts working together. Our eyes, our, our eyes are used to see. Our ears are used to hear. We don't ask our eyes to speak. We don't ask our ears to write. It goes beyond their capabilities. We need to know what we can and cannot do and focus on our capabilities. Second, this concept allows us to focus on the gifts that God has given. Once we know our own abilities and our limitations, we need to accept and focus on what we can do. Giving time and attention to our gifts empowers us to hone in on what we can do for God. Third, we must use our gifts in the, way, in the right way and for the right reasons. Our gift may be humble in comparison to someone else, but it doesn't mean that it's any less important. However, we, when we use our gifts to be that living sacrifice, our motive should be to serve God. If we use our gifts and our motives are done out of a sense of pride or envy or status or power, then we lose our uniqueness. Our lives must be lived out for God's purpose or we are not living for God. So let's do it with a story. We're all, we're all, I see the smile, so you're ready for one of my famous stories, which are getting harder and harder to find. But this is a story about a professor who uh, was a good professor, but he was famous for giving the most painful and excruciatingly difficult final exams. They were just awful. And people, uh, dreaded. It was one of those classes that everybody was required to take. You couldn't not have this professor. And people dreaded coming to class. They, they loved the professor. They, they always learned something in the class that they could apply practically to life. It, it, was a, it was a bonus in just a college class. But they hated that they knew that that dreaded final exam was coming up. And even the professor's colleagues had talked to him and said, you know, maybe it's time to be a little bit more lenient. Maybe it's time for your legacy to be something else. You don't have to give these excruciating exams. So one day the professor decided that we'd try something different. And he met with his class and he says, I know you've all been dreading for the last several weeks my final. I know you've heard by reputation how hard they are. And I know that you're already beginning to sweat bullets about what's coming. He says, so 
I've talked to my colleagues, they've suggested I do something a little differently. So this year I've decided that the final exam is going to be different. It's not going to be any less difficult. That's what I do. But I've decided this year I'm going to let it be an open note test. And you could see all the smile was coming on all the students' faces. And he says, here's the parameters. You get one eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper. And any figure fact, notes, anything you've learned in class that you can put on that piece of paper, you can use on your final exam. You can use the front and back of that paper. You're just confined to one eight and a half inch piece of paper and whatever you can fit onto it. So this relieved the class and for the next week, they started studying and cramming and getting everything they could on their pieces of paper. Some students typed all their notes out and then shrunk all the typed words to cut it and paste it to get as much information as they could on that sheet of paper. One student went as far and made the font so small that he couldn't read it without a magnifying glass. And that was okay because he had his one sheet of paper and he was going to do well on this test. And now that the test was different, everybody wanted to be the one that finally got an A on his exam. So they studied, and they studied hard. And the day of the exam came, and their pencils were sharpened, and their minds were honed, and their cheat sheets were ready. And when the professor handed out the test, all the students started feverishly looking through their notes and finding answers and trying to transfer and trying to get everything right for the test. But one student just sat there, staring at his exam. And about five minutes into the exam, the classroom door opened and um, another man walked in and he walked up to the student, the one who had been staring at the test, he walked up to his desk and that student took an eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper and he put it on the ground and this advanced master's candidate student stood on his piece of paper and gave him everything he needed to know for the final exam. And that year, that student was the only one to get an A. That student was able, in a creative way, to know his limitations, to know his gifts, and to respect the God-given gifts of other people, to work in this world to make a difference, even if it was for a, an exam on a test. We are to be those living sacrifices for God. We are to do this every second of our lives relentlessly without ever giving up. And we can do this when we know our own limitations, when we know what we can do and what we can't do, when we embrace and live for God with the things that we can do. We can do this when we recognize the God-given gifts that we have been bestowed with and we can use those gifts to serve God in the world. And we can do this when our motivation is clear, when we are doing this for God and not for ourselves. Is this hard? Absolutely. Can we do this? With God's help, we can. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us this day. Help us to do your work, no matter what that is. Give us your presence and your love to see things through, now and always. Amen.